In this episode of Candid, under the format of professional conversations, I'm joined by Michael Coles, the man who built pick and pay clothing for over 24 years, as well as now busy with building of Unique, which is part of the ShopRite Checkers Group. So Michael has an immense amount of business knowledge, and this session is really focused on asking him what decisions were critical throughout his professional career of more than 40 years within the retail industry, and where it all started, which isn't on his LinkedIn CV. So I hope that you'll enjoy this and apply the insights that Michael shares to your professional career as well. If we jump straight into just a highlight reel of where you've spent your time over the last couple of decades, from how I've looked at it now on LinkedIn, you've, you've shared that you spent around 25 years at Pick and Pay, being the head of the clothing division there. And then you went into uh, Woolies for about three years. And now you're currently serving at Checkers and building their unique clothing brand. But what happened before Pick and Pay? Because that's not on your LinkedIn profile. So yeah. can you maybe highlight a bit about that? Okay, so I'm Cape Town born and bred. I went to university at UCT, studied economics. I did an honours degree in economics and at the time felt I should do something in the field of economics because so I ended up working for a company called Mobile. Now, you mentioned earlier decades in this business and it sounds like a long time, but it is literally decades. I've been I've been in the in the retail game for about four decades now. Um, I start, so, so I started working at, uh, at a company called Mobile. I don't know if you know it. It uh, became Engine. And, and that, that I just knew wasn't for me. Where Even when I was at university, I was always, I, I wouldn't say I was into clothing in the sense of being the best dressed, but I just liked clothing. And I always felt I should get into the, into the rag trade in some way. And I responded to an ad in the paper to join Woolworths as a merchandiser. I think this was sometime late 70s, joined them, and the minute I joined Woolworths, I realized that this is what I was born to do. Well, when you say born to do, you know, it's, it sometimes it takes a while to actually understand what it is you want to do in life. You don't always get that, uh, um, that spark early on in your life. Some people are lucky enough to do it, but but I didn't. And, but, but I joined Woolworths, and I realized that being in the rag trade was what I was, uh, that was, that was my destiny. And I spent 10 years there learning everything I knew about retail. Uh, it was, at, as I say, at the feet of masters. There were, um, at the time, Woolworths was the premier retailing organization in, in, in South Africa. There were a number of great retailers that came through that organization and, in fact, went on to, to, to be with uh, the tours of the world, the Mr. Prices of the world, et cetera, et cetera. It was really a, a learning ground um, a kind of leadership uh, course for almost all retailers at the time. It was known for its, for how well they trained people. So, um, so I worked there for for a long time and learned everything I knew about retail. I made quite a good good, good progress there. Uh, and then at the time, um, around mid '80s, South Africa was going through quite a lot of upheaval, and and, and my wife and I decided to. Uh, try something else. We went to um, live in London for a while. I worked for a small retail company there called Topshop. Don't know if you know the, if you know it. Um, yeah, I mean they they still are would, um, still operating today. They they still are around. Uh, they are not uh, where they used to be. In you know the retail. Uh, I'll talk about this maybe if you if we get to it. But retail around the world is changing quite dramatically. The the brands that were really hot. 20, 30 years ago, like the Gap, Abercrombie & Fitch, uh, Top Shop, Top Man, these brands seem to have disappeared and uh, and, and struggling to, to, to make new traction. So um, I was working for one of them and decided that living in London wasn't for me, came back to South Africa, uh, joined a small manufacturing company that was supplying uh, uh, ladies' lingerie to, to Woolworths. I worked there for a few years. And then a big break came when I got a call from a headhunter saying they were looking for someone to head up the clothing business at Pick and Pay, which at the time was a small business. It was sold, uh, clothing was only sold in hypermarkets, but they really felt that there could be, could, uh, more could be done with the brand. Um, 
So I started there uh, in the mid-90s, 1995. Uh, I was there, as you said, for just under 25 years. Took the brand from literally nothing to, by the time I left, we'd opened 200 clothing stores, uh, standalone clothing stores. And, um, and that's basically when I retired. I actually, you know, company, big companies these days, you have to retire at a certain age. They, they have uh, succession uh, commitments that they make to their shareholders, and, uh, and I retired. And I was, I, in retirement, uh, always heard I was in retirement. They called me back in there to assist them through the COVID uh, transition. There was, it was quite a struggle uh, during um, that COVID time. Uh, I assisted them for three years I was there, uh, and while at it, towards the end of my uh, tenure there, um, I started talking to Peter Engelbrecht at uh, ShopRite to start a clothing business because it was the one area of retail that they were not uh, represented. And we started the, the unique brand two years ago, and, and uh, that's where we are now. Um, it's been two years. It's been a very successful uh, brand launch, um, and and it's got a great future. So, I've been involved in one, two, three startups. Actually, the other startup that you don't know about is while I was at Woolworths, I actually um, Woolworths bought uh, the Macro brand. I don't know if you know it. It became part of MassMart. Yes. Uh, but so, so, this, so there's a bit of history there. Got it? Is this in the seventies when when Woolies this, bought? This was in this was in the this was in the early eighties. Okay, okay. Uh, when when companies were were divesting out of South Africa, uh, Macro was a Dutch-owned company. They um, were divesting, and they had six big, uh, what they called, uh, Macro stores, which are really big, uh, hypermarket type stores mm. and uh, Woolworths bought them uh, six of them and while I, while I was at Woolworths I was seconded to them to start the clothing business at the macro uh, stores and I started a brand there called Legend which I believe is still going today so I mean, that was my first that was my first startup pick and pay clothing was my second startup and now macro uh, at ShopRite the unique brand is my third startup so I've been involved, involved in quite a so that's a very uh, long-winded, brief history of, of my career to date. That's perfect, and I think I want to I want to unpack a few a few topics that you shared there. So, so the one is, I've learned that a lot of the time we communicate to everyone that we need to follow our passion, assuming that everyone actually knows what their passion is, and there's almost, in my experience, there's like this pressure for someone to know what their passion is because. You know, you can see Michael, he's he's now doing um, his particular, you know, passion now within the clothing, within the fashion side of things. He loves building. He loves, you know, directing. And and I think people get quite nervous um, and anxious if they don't have that passion. So what do you think about this perspective where it's less about us trying to find our passion right now, no matter what stage we are within our professional careers, but more about being very curious and as a consequence of being curious and exploring that as a consequence of that you then are um are doing things and being exposed to different environments and from that from doing then you actually build up a passion for say you know clothing in this case i mean what's your view on that um perspective well look i i, I always i always enjoyed clothing uh and I enjoyed the hustle and bustle of retail, the buying and selling. You know, at a very young age in a retail environment, you get exposed to the world of business. You're making decisions of buying and selling product at a price, uh, at a cost, selling it at a price, making a profit. You get exposed to the world of commerce quite, quite young. And if you like the world of commerce, which let's 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 not talk about clothing for now. It could have been foods. Uh, if you like the world of commerce, which is uh, buying and selling goods and, and making a profit, and you do your job as well as you can, you will find a niche where you yourself could love it. So, uh, and, and, and retail has got so many different components to it. I happen to be uh, 
uh, in the in the clothing then, because I happen to like clothing. But there's homeware, there's electronics, there's food, there's hardware. Uh, there are all sorts of areas where um, where customers need products, and if you can find a niche that says, "Well, I'm going to buy this garment at, or this product at this price, sell it at that product because price because I know that customers want it," um, you, you could you could you could do well. So I, I think the the key is to find what it is people like, and what it is that you can do to deliver what they like in such a way that they pay you well for it. Now that sounds a bit uh, quite broad um, because sometimes you can't always get exactly what your passion is. I mean, your, pa your passion may be music, but, you, but unless you're really good, you're not going to make a living out of music or painting. Uh, you, you know, so there could be passions that you have that are not related to commerce and you may or may not make a living out of it. But if you can marry your passion with commerce, with customers, with a, an understanding of how business works, then you've got the best of, of both, of all worlds, actually. Um, now I, I don't know if I quite responded to, to, your, to, your, uh, to, your, to your question, because, as I, as I said, may, may or may not necessarily be a passion that you follow, but it is something that you love to do. Um, that, that, and, and, and in the doing... Uh, you, you become good at what you do, and by, by being good at what you do, you, you, you enjoy what you're doing more. So it's, it's in the doing. I, I always used to say to people, you know, even when I, when I, when I worked in all my careers, uh, people would come up to me and say to me, how can I get to where you are? And I used to always say to them, well, whatever you're doing, whether it's making tea, whether it's uh, sweeping the floor, whether it's serving customers on the shop floor, which is quite a mundane job. Just do it to the best of your ability. Um, and, and don't expect that the next job is the one that's me meant for you, because sometimes it's not. Sometimes life takes you in directions that you don't quite uh, perceive when you're in the moment. But, but things happen if you, and if you're doing your job to the best of your ability, uh, things will come to you that you can't dream of uh, when you when you're in it, and and that that has always been my advice to 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 young people who want to kind of look up to me and say, well, how can I be what you are? And I say, just do your job to the best of your ability. I I loved what I was doing because I thought I'm going to do this job no matter what it is to the best of my ability. When I started at Woolworths, for example, um, every morning we had to be there at six o'clock at, at uh, the Adley Street store, and we had to unpack trucks. Loads and loads, truckloads of bread. And I always made sure that I packed the bread in the best way I could. According to the, 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 the rule, I, you know, I didn't, always, I didn't think to myself at the time, I'm just doing this temporarily because they want to uh, uh, get me um, aligned with the company's values, etc. for a future job. I'm going to do this job to the best of my ability. And I got noticed even then. So... I think that, that if, I, if there's one thing I can say to young people is whatever you're doing, just do it to the best of your ability because that's how you're going to enjoy yourself and that's how you're going to get noticed. And, and no matter what it is, it can, be, it can be a mundane job, just do it to the best of your ability. It reminds now, I, don't me know, I don't know if that helps you to... Yeah, ab absolutely. So, so it reminds me of an anecdote shared by, um, I think it was someone in the American military where he spoke about the principle of just making your bed <laughs> in the morning to just, to just yep. start your day off making your bed, having that level of discipline for something so mundane, so um, you know, repetitive. Uh, but, but that discipline over time is compounding. Um, and that, uh, you know, exposes you then to other opportunities just as a consequence of you paying attention um, and taking pride in what you do. So, yeah, I, I think it's a it's a, a great experience share from your side. And Michael, there is, there you, is yeah, there, there is a there is a I think there's a famous YouTube clip of a of an army general making a having a conversation to the troops about how you're going to be the best troop. And I think the starting point for all of them is the first thing you do in the morning is make your bed, mm. because that is one task completed, and then you move to the next task and you complete that task. And to the next task, and so on, and so on, and so on. Brilliant. So yeah, I get. That. So so if we if we actually 
refer back to the first time that you were at Woolworths because you spoke about it being a training ground and you spoke about, you know, from a leadership point of view, the technical side, and a lot of people came from that, uh, let's call it that chapter and have gone on to, to, to do incredible things across the retail industry. You know, it reminds me of the PayPal mafia around Elon Musk and, and Peter Thiel and everyone where they, there was a particular training ground that they all um, you know, went through. And as a consequence, they, of course, went into their own ventures and did very, very well. Now, mm. what I want to pay attention to here is who were the people or who was the person that enabled that environment for you all to actually have a, such a training ground that was so fruitful? Um, and you mean specifically in the case of Woolworths? So, yeah, so you, you spoke about the team at Woolies. Um, you know, you really were in a place where all of you trained well from a leadership point of view. So what was it about that environment at Woolworths back then that allowed you to get that leadership training and that technical training to the extent that it did where so many people from that, that chapter uh, did on, uh, uh, went on to do great things? Okay, um, it, it's a little known fact. Uh, in fact, it might not be so little known, but during the 50s sometime, uh, Woolworths developed a very close relationship with Marks and Spencers in the UK. And Marks and Spencers at the time was the leading retail organization, not only in the UK, but probably in the world. They innovated and they did most of the good things uh, that a lot of other retailers followed on from subsequently. And uh, through this tie-up, Woolworths adopted many of the uh, philosophies and policies and ways of working that Marks and Spencers had developed. Um, retail at the time was was an honourable uh, profession. You know, I don't know if it's still that today, but at that time, retail really was an honourable profession. If you could get a job at Marks and Spencers, you were kind of made for life. And I think. The same applied to Woolworths. Woolworths uh, in the 60s and 70s was a place you wanted to go to work, to learn how to run and be a businessman. And what, what Woolworths did, what they, they developed training programs where you were mentored as a, as a young man or young woman. You were mentored when you came to the company by a person with experience. And, that, and, you, and you stuck with that person for six months to a year. And they taught you everything they knew that they'd learned from a previous uh, mentor. They taught you everything you knew about uh, to, to know th uh, about retail and all the metrics that, that, that is important in retail. Stock turn, uh, uh, margins, margin management, uh, how to grow sales, how to innovate. All these uh, uh, retail metrics were part and parcel of the way Woolworths uh, did business. And of course... They became the premier retailer in the 70s, uh, 60s, in the 70s. And a lot of other retailers started looking at uh, Woolworths success and started thinking, well, hold on, we can be like that, but we have to bring in some of those Woolworths people. So the more Woolworths trained, the more people got poached. So, so they just kept, kept on training. It was almost like for every person doing a job, there was someone next door to that person being trained. So it was, it was a philosophy, it was a way of working and a way of thinking that, that, uh, that, that Woolworths imbued the company with. They decided, we need good people, we're going to take them from an early age and we're going to teach them from scratch. It's going to become the university of retail. We're going to teach people how to be retailers and that's what they did. It was, their, it was just part and parcel of their uh, way of working. Um, I don't know how much of it still remains. I, I, I think not too much. I think there's a lot of poaching going on today around retailers pulling people from other retailers who they think are good. And lot, there's, there's a lot of movement uh, in retail. But in the, in the, in the old days at, at Woolworths, you kind of, if you were good, you stayed there and you just kept on uh, working in the company uh, literally for life. So it was, it was um, Grant, it was, it was just part of the fabric of the business that they had a training and a development philosophy to bring young people into the business and train them and make them good retailers. 
It's so, so it wasn't simple. one specific person. It was more just the philosophy of the business was to train people and train them well. It's so simple, but it actually makes it so exceptional where you invest so significantly and so intentionally within such a buddy system and such a, a systemized way for people to not get left behind and for people to really uh, reach the potential that maybe they're not even aware of, um, you know, when, when joining. So I think, again, it's just a reminder to all businesses and even just if you're in a, in a team and it doesn't matter how big that team is, to not take for granted that um, onboarding experience for every employee, because I think, uh, yeah, from my experience and from my network of of, of, of friends within the a varying degree of, of industries, the onboarding side is still not as as great as you would think it would be. Even though mm. the data is there, people know that it <laughs> that it's effective, and I think it just shows you perhaps some of the, and I'm. I'm an accountant on my side, but I mean, you know, when you just apply a numbers game to this and you and you don't realize the the, the true qualitative aspect of it, it, it kind of um, you know leaves it in um, in the rearview mirror. So again, just a nice reminder that we have to take it very seriously, as evident of what's happened with Willies, and I know there's a lot of other businesses that do ha do have it as well. Yeah, you see, I, th I think I think what happens is is um, people you can measure the extra staff required when you've got a good training program in place, whereas you don't, you aren't able to measure the benefit, the downstream benefit. So it's almost like there's a short-term cost for a long-term benefit and a lot of, and when, and when companies are, when times are hard and they have to cut costs, kind of the first things that go are, well, the training program, do we need so many trainees? Uh, and, 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 the, and, and you, you only feel the, the, the cost of that, decision five ten years down the track you know so uh yeah it's it's, it's kind of having a long-term philosophy about if you train people well you're going to have good people in your business and your business is going to thrive uh and 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 the other thing about training people well is you imbue them with the culture of the business so you can carry the culture of the business through um multiple generations of people uh, intact because I, I find one of the things that goes, the minute people start moving around a business, the culture sort of dissipates and you don't quite know who you are in the end. Fully agree with that. So. And if you now think about this, this experience that you've gained in moving from one organization like Woolies and moving then to pick and pay and building a business within a business, basically, for, for you, what would you say is a key learning there? Because... I think there's a lot of people talking now about entrepreneurship, especially within that corporate space, encouraging people to innovate and build within the business, you know, have an entrepreneurial mindset uh, versus just, you know, of course, going off and being an entrepreneur by yourself. For you, what is that type of learning from, I mean, literally, you know, just over two decades at Pick and Pay, building a business within a big business? Uh, what was that type of experience that, that, you know, the, the nuggets that you gained along the way. Okay, so so going, going to pick and pay um, and having had all that experience of, of uh, Woolworths behind me, um, th there were a couple of things. So firstly, there are in, in retail, there are, there are certain metrics that you have to be mindful of. You can't ignore margins you can't ignore sales you can't ignore stock turn you can't so all those metrics are things that you run your business by and this is how you measure your uh let's call it technical success um but what was more important for me was to in building a brand i had to have people who understood the brand and that were able to make the decisions that were going to push the brand forward so when i started at uh, can pay there were there was it was a small team and in order to bolster the team I had to bring in people from outside and the danger with that and I only found that out in retro in retrospect was that people from outside came with their ideas that they'd learned at companies that were that they'd worked at before and it, it started tearing apart the culture that I was trying to build and the and the and the, the way I wanted to run the business because it was a continuous um, 
uh, that was continuously conflicting that someone would come from, say, Retailer Y and say, look, we, we used to do it like this at Retailer Y. And then I'd get someone else from Retailer X and they'd say, we did it like this at Retailer X. And before you knew it, you had conflict. And I realized very early on that in order to develop a strategy and a philosophy and a culture uh, of, of excellence, of whatever it was I wanted to achieve, I had to bring people in from the ground floor up. And I made it a policy of bringing in youngsters uh, straight from their secondary education or their, or their tertiary education and letting them learn the ropes of the business for six months, even paying them a small kind of uh, uh, school fee of, of sort, just so that they could learn the business a bit and we could learn about them a bit. And at the end of that period, we would say, right, we think you're a fit, we're going to hire you, or we think you're not a fit and uh, the contract was, was, was terminated. And in this way, we, we, we built the business with a great bunch of people that were with the program, that understood the culture, that understood what had to be done and were willing and hardworking to make it happen. And I think that that was, I think, the, the, the single biggest lesson that I was able to apply uh, in, in, a, in a startup career was getting the right people in place who understood exactly what was required and were able to do it. And of course, your job then as a leader uh, is, a, is, is almost like conducting an orchestra. You don't really have to make every decision any longer, but you've got people in place who are... Who are uh, uh, trained and willing and, and, and motivated to make the decisions uh, that are required. Because in retail, you're making 100 decisions every day. You know, you can't be on top of every single decision. And, and it worked. It, uh, it really worked for, for a long time. And I, I think the company is still growing and it's still doing well. And uh, that's testament to a business that, was, that uh, has been well-founded and, and the foundational basis of the business is good which allows it to keep on growing in a positive way. You know, things didn't fall apart after I, I, I retired. They kept on going. So, uh, and, and, and I think it's largely because of procedures, structures, and people that we put in place. That, that was, I think, probably the single biggest lesson that I was able to uh, apply to the, to the business. Of course, things like innovation, you've always got to be innovating in, in You've always got to be taking risks. You've always got to be moving retail forward because uh, nothing stands still. Uh, if, you're not, if you're not taking the business forward, unfortunately, someone else is taking their business forward and you're going backwards. So you, you've got to keep taking the business forward. So you're juggling a lot of balls, and the one common denominator is having the right people in place so that if a ball falls, they catch it, they toss the right – you know, it just works uh, with that combination of factors. I love the analogy with the conductor because, um, you know, in my in my previous company, I shared with the team how as a conductor, and if you are in a leadership role, then as a conductor, your back is actually facing the audience, i.e. the customer, and you're actually just focused on your team, uh, on the musicians and them. And, and, and those mu mu musicians are actually the ones facing the, the audience and actually serving the customer. They're serving the audience. So you just, if you are in a leadership role, um, or at a level where you have to, you know, manage and lead an entire organization, you just have to focus on your people and, and, and trust in making sure that if they've got the right environment there, they're going to thrive and they're going to serve the customer to the best of their ability. So I definitely agree with you on that analogy. Yeah, look, at, 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 we, were, we, were, we were spinning like a finely tuned top, you know, and, and, and it was a question of, uh, of fine tuning decisions to optimize them. But... Everyone was doing their job to perfection, and and and, and made my job easy because, uh, as I say, I was I was simply conducting a massive orchestra of decision making. Uh, and and also another takeaway here, Michael, is around the fact that you have to exert your energy in certain places, in certain areas within a team, within an organization, and and I think what how you describe. In, um, employing people from other organizations where they were fixated on how they used to do things, the level of energy that you 
I can assume that you had to exert just to maintain that that conflict or to try your best to resolve it versus mm -hmm. reallocating that energy into young, you know, aspiring professionals in, in, in retail, it's just a far better use or utilization of your energy in terms of, as you say, um, building a far more cohesive, far more collaborative and, and, and united culture. So uh, it's definitely a takeaway that, that I'm going to look to apply in, in, in my career as well. So thanks for sharing that. No, look, someone could come from another organization with 15 years experience, but they've got 15 years of experience in doing something in a certain way. When they come to my organization or whoever's organization, they've got to unlearn, unless it's a, unless it's a completely transferable skill, like a, like a goalkeeper for a soccer team. You know, there you don't have to unlearn a person how to be a goalkeeper. You just slot into a new team. So transfer, transferability of staff is, is highly coveted. Uh, and you can see it, um, but but where, but in such certain organisations, transferability of, of skills isn't uh, usually the best way of, 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 of making use of people. And, and I'm just talking from my experience. As I say, it doesn't apply to everything. Mm. It also it also kind of links to the fact that I can't recall the the title or the or the publisher of the article, but they spoke about how necessary today is around us needing to unlearn the ability for you to be able to unlearn and i think if i yeah. were to put that in, in in my own words i think for me it's are you coachable <laughs> are you coachable yeah. or not you know are you going to come there with a student mindset and and even though you possibly perhaps say have got 5 10 15 years of experience within your field are you going to be receptive to to other ideas and be that 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 student because at the end of the day doesn't matter what age we are, we, we can be a student, we can practice on a day to day basis to learn more. Mm -hmm. But in saying that, yeah, we do need to be able to, uh, to unlearn a lot of the things that we thought yeah, yeah. may have been right at that point in time. And that's the hard part, because you've got to unlearn your whole egos uh, wrapped up in the way you've done a particular job in a particular way for 15 years or 10 years or whatever, and to unlearn it and learn a new way means letting go of quite a bit of ego and uh, and that's probably the harder part you know mm. so actually turning that you know maybe uh looking at the inverse of that if we were to put ourselves now in your position or in that leadership position now where you're when you when you have uh team members now that are part of the team and they are gonna need to unlearn certain things how do you approach that how if, you know, if I were to say, Michael, you're in charge of this business now, or I mean, even unique clothing now, how do you take people along, um, you know, the, the path to, to really being open-minded and, and, and learning new and, and, and unlearning what they thought was perfect <laughs> back then? Yeah, yeah, I guess that's where coaching comes into it. Uh, but, it but it's personal uh, coaching. It's not just, you know, you've got to spend time. That's where you've got to spend time with people and explain to them why you're doing the way you're doing things and, and give them and, and spend time with them. You know, don't, you know, the, the easy, the easy uh, uh, way to do it or the, the, the short-term gain way of doing it is to just say, listen, this is how I'd want it done. Just please follow my instructions. But they won't get it. And come, a, come the, in, a, in a week's time, you're going to be say, faced with the same position again. And, so you, you've got to spend time, you've got to spend time uh, explaining what it is you are expecting, how are you expecting it to be done, and just continuously spending time with people. That's the only way. And, and you will learn quite quickly as a coach how much more time. Is this person coachable? Is, is it possible that this person will make the change? Can you see a glimmer? Uh, if not, you may have to have a different conversation. But if the answer is yes, I think this person is coachable, you've got to give yourself a timeline and just work very closely with whoever it is to make sure that uh, they get what it is you are uh, expecting and that they start understanding it. Because I think any business must be rooted in some kind of logic. It can't just, it can't just be a randomly... A, a random process. There must be logic behind what... what what decisions are expected. 
And if you can if you can understand the logic yourself, because sometimes you've learned a job how to do a job, but you don't quite understand deeply what the logic is behind what that is all about. Um, I, I mean, for example, even just the the, the training program that that uh, that Wu was at, there was a logic behind it. The logic being that if we train people well, we will have a future um, stream of well trained staff. So there's a logic now. I think in every decision-making process, there should be some or other logic that that defines the process, and, and, is, and through that, you're able to um, train someone and, and help them to see the logic of your approach. What sometimes does happen is your logic may not be 100%, and sometimes someone is able to say to you, hold on a second, if we're going to approach this logically, then have you look at it this way around, and then you yourself may have to change your mind about things. Uh, it's, that, it's that famous expression, when the facts change, I change my mind. Uh, what do you do? Um, uh, so, so, so sometimes you just have to um, make sure that, that, everyone is, that everything you're doing is rooted in a kind of logic that is coachable. Uh, and, I, and I think that, that then people get it for themselves. It reminds me of, of, of the of a mindset or of an approach to anything in business, in my view, which is, which is like building um, a hypothesis, like kind of, you know, this is what we think is going to happen. This is why we think it, it will happen. This is what we're going to need. Um, and kind of taking that experimentation approach to this, whereby you, you, you're, you're seeking to be disproven <laughs> in terms of the hypothesis to make sure that you are um, obtaining the most relevant and useful and timely facts about, you know, the mm. position mm. that you're in. So for me, I absolutely agree with that where people, yeah, I mean, you, you can't just let emotion drive decisions. And as you probably experienced as I've and many people watching or listening have experienced the, the people that just drive with pure emotion as, as the baseline of their decision-making, it just creates so much um, miscommunication, confusion, lack of clarity. So, mm. I think uh, that for me has has been a big one in respecting or kind of um, trying to follow the people that I know that there's far more of a cognitive first than than just an, a feeling that they that, that they're going with. Yeah, and sometimes you've got to make decisions quickly, only to learn fast. You know, uh, uh, it's better to make a decision, fail, learn from it, and. It, and, and move forward than to not make a decision at all. Mm. And, and you never know quite what is the right thing to do. Uh, so, yeah, also making decisions. Uh, this, this was another big thing that I did because uh, in, the, in the pick and pay environment, I, I had quite a lot of um, freedom to run the business in the way I felt was the right way to run the business. And... Obviously, there were some, it's, you know, when you're innovating, you have to take risks, and sometimes the risks don't work out, and you, and, you, and you don't get it right. Fail fast, learn from it, uh, and, and take it forward, uh, move, it, move forward, uh, learn, having learned from those mistakes. I, I always believed you just make decisions, just keep making decisions, because that way you will learn very quickly what was the right decision to make and what was the wrong decision to make. And you can fine tune whatever it is you're trying to achieve by making those uh, those mistakes and failing fast, as I say. So, talking about decisions, you've made, you know, in the in the more recent years, you've made two critical decisions, and the one was, you know, from retiring to pick and pay, uh, from retiring from pick and pay, then to to after some time to go to Woolworths, and then to then to you uh, or Shoprite Checkers, uh, you know, to start up Unique. So. Talk to me a bit about why you made the decision to go into Woolworths because that, for me, my understanding was more of like a, a turnaround or kind of like just a, a revamp or some, some level of um, re-energization, re-energizing um, energy that was needed. Talk to me a bit about, you know, those two critical decisions that you made and, and, and what, what was the reasoning around it. Okay, so um, in uh, okay, so retiring from pick and pay was a. I was age sixty three when I retired. The retirement age was sixty, but I spent another three years there on contract, and they they had to they had to find succession um, because 
as a as a uh, for for good corporate governance. You can't just have a situation where your company is totally dependent on a key on any, on one key individual. So they 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 found succession. Okay, and uh, I moved on. Woolworths then heard I was in. Um, uh, in retirement, and they approached me and said, we are finding ourselves in a bit of difficulty. The clothing business, what they called FPH at the time, was struggling. And uh, I think this is the, uh, on the record that the clothing business was, was uh, struggling. They were having problems in Australia with the David Jones business, and they just needed someone to assist in the uh, assessment of the business and taking it forward. And what I found was that Woolworths were, had been left behind in, in a number of ways. Uh, they were left behind with, uh, with their logistics, so there was catching up that had to, do, uh, to, to be done. They'd been left behind with the way they displayed product on the floor. So, for example, little things like, like a lot of their merchandise was still displayed on racks. Uh, I, I used tables in the pick-and-pay environment to display merchandise. And I felt that Woolworths could benefit from that experience. Um, they also had a lot of different brands in their business that were kind of competing with each other, so that needed to be cleaned up. So I felt I could make a contribution, and I was there for about three years. And uh, I think I did assist them to clean things up, and, and, and the, the, um, the business kind of bottomed out. It was also over COVID. I, it was a, you know, I joined the company in January 2019, and a year later, COVID hit, and uh, COVID kind of killed everything for about six months, if you recall. Mm. Um, so, so there was that very difficult period as well, which which had to be uh, managed. Uh, and uh, I was I was uh, on on a two year contract at uh, at Woolworths, and they extended that to another year, so I was there for three years. And in the final, well, after my contract concluded, I started talking to Peter Engelbrecht about starting a clothing business. Well, we made contact with each other, put it that way. It wasn't uh, my own pitch. We we decided to start looking at the possibility of uh, of starting a clothing business. Uh, It was the one area that ShopRite had not yet been, um, had not yet entered the retail fray, let's call it. And uh, they were keen to see what they could do, uh, and I, it was a, I was able to harness all the energy and experience and learning from my previous decades of retail into that one moment of uh, of a new retail business. Um, and so we started the business. We started from scratch, and we opened our first store in March last year with quite a lot of innovative um, uh, things that, that we, uh, you, I'm sure you've been to the store. We were the, one of the first, if not the first uh, business to go cashless. Uh, we were the first to have a self-service um, business, which at the time when we were talking about it, people said this would never work. And this is South Africa. And in fact, it worked fantastically well. Um, but the most important thing for me was to have to do a few things well. Uh, it's quite important in, in, in you know, you know you've, you've heard of the book, uh, that book, The Paradox of Choice. You give people too much choice and they become confused and they just walk out the store. And I find that a lot of retailers today all over the world and South Africa offer customers just too much choice. And... And some some customers like a lot of choice. Uh, young, uh, the Zara, for example, the Zara uh, business offers customers a wide variety of choices uh, of articles within categories, um, and and the, and that's what the Zara customer wants. But there are a lot of customers out there that we found as you get older, you don't want to spend so much time shopping for clothing. You want to spend as little time as possible shopping for clothing. We found, and therefore make the, the, the choices for the customer and do the few things that customers really want, do them well. And that was our philosophy. That's what we built that business on. And that's, that's where it is today, you know, offering customers uh, 
a few things done well. Um, and, and we're not, you know, the, the, the business world is littered with uh, uh, of businesses that have been successful doing a few things well. If you look at Apple, you can take the entire product range of Apple, put it on a table, and, that's, and that is Apple. And it's a, it's a trillion dollar value business. Uh, if you look at Tesla, Tesla's got, how many cars have they got? They've got two cars and a truck. That's what they sell. Uh, but their market cap is bigger than all the, uh, the other motor industry businesses in America combined. So there is merit in doing a few things well. And that was one of the things we were determined to do in, in the space of, of the unique business in, in the ShopRite business. Yeah, well, I, I've definitely, I've definitely, definitely visited, and I, and I, and I, and I took a couple of um, shots there that I'll include also on the podcast. And I think, I think that just how how the experience is there is is refreshing, and it's not overwhelming as you've said, as you've shared. Like it's it's really just focused. So I think as a consumer, I can definitely see that being needed in a in a world where it's it's becoming very overwhelming with information you know with with everything trying to grab your attention so so i, I can definitely agree with you there and mike we we've now kind of run out of time here so i think yeah. um i i want to ask you do you have anything that you'd like to just leave you know the the audience with in terms of just you know if you were to sum up what we've chatted about and maybe even something that we haven't that they need to just be aware about going forward that you would you know want to pass on to them uh, you're talking maybe about young people that have started their careers or people that yeah, are in their they, career. Yeah, aspiring professionals and even just, you know, just recent professionals that have, that have entered the industry in, in whatever industry it is. Yeah, so, so recent, recent professionals, I think you should, uh, whatever it is you decide to do, do it as well as you can. Give it your best shot. Uh, don't think that it's better if you do this – just get through this job because the real job you want is is somewhere else. Um, I, I think I think you you've got to uh, you've got to decide that you're not wasting your time that you're giving this thing that you're doing its best shot. Um, and then and then in business itself, it's 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 important to understand what you are capable of doing, what your limits are, what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are. I think it's important to do those internal, as they, as they call them, SWOT uh, analyses. I know it doesn't apply. It, it does, in fact, apply to, a, to, a, to individuals. You can, you can work out what your strengths are. You should write them down. You should work out what your weaknesses are. Or you write them down. What opportunities you are blessed with and what threats face you. You can, you can do that kind of analysis, write these things down, and slowly a picture will emerge of what it is about you that that is marketable, that is going to allow you to um, uh, make yourself valuable and, and make it, give you a good living. And at the same time, you'll be able to enjoy what you're doing. And I think it's very important that you, every day when you go to work, you should look forward to it. You should, you should be kind of, this is something you've got to spend eight hours of every day doing it's a third of your life at work. You've got to make sure that you're working with people you like, people that you, well, not only like, but that share your values um, because you're spending all that time with those, with those people. So, so they can't be foreigners to you. They can't be strange to your way of doing things. Um, yeah, you've got, to, you've got to understand yourself. I think very importantly, you've got to know what is it about you that makes you likable, that makes you... Uh, not likable, what is it about you that is uh, able to make money for the company? If it's your own business, what is it about you that makes you um, valuable to, the, to your customer? Um, so it, it's quite, it, look, it's hard, to, it's hard to put down a philosophy of how to succeed in a few short words. I mean, people write books about it, umpteen books about it. So. But uh, I think the thing is, you know, take, take stock of yourself, take stock of your circumstances and do your best within that to optimize uh, the, the, the card you've been dealt. Amazing. Thank you so much, Mike. I really appreciate it. And I think uh, just what you've, 
what you've been a part of, what you've co contributed to, uh, specifically in the retail space, but more importantly to the people that you know you've served along the way. I think is just uh, instrumental. So thanks for for being an example. And I know a lot of people are going to gain a lot of value uh, from our discussion today. I hope so. Thank you very much for having me on.